Hi guys, uh, this is Dr. Pavan and today I'm here to discuss with you some surgery related MCQs. So we will talk about these particular topics and we will discuss relevant points from this particular topic. So without wasting any further time, let us start with the first question. The first question which I have for you guys is a germline mutation in the BRCA1 or the BRCA2. Okay, so germline mutation in the BRCA1 or the BRCA2 is associated with all of the following characteristics except it is an autosomal dominant transmission, high incidence of the breast and the ovarian cancer in the woman, higher than average incidence of breast cancer in men, and late onset of the breast cancer. So, what do you uh, think, guys? What is the answer over here? Okay, so a germline mutation in the BRCA1 or the BRCA2 is associated with all of the following except it is not the late onset of the breast cancer, right? Okay, so obviously this is associated with an early onset of the breast cancer. As we all know, the breast cancer, it can be either sporadic or it can be germline. If at all it is a germline, it must be having one or the other genetic conditions like BRCA1 or BRCA2. Okay. It, there would be one or the other genetic mutation like this and this is associated with the early onset of the breast cancer okay this is associated with an early onset now what you need to understand and appreciate is that in the BRCA it is not just a breast cancer which is kind of having an increased risk it is what is referred to as this familial breast and ovarian cancer syndrome okay so what is this BRCA referred to as BRCA is basically called as a familial breast and ovarian cancer syndrome so it means that in if at all the patient is having a BRCA gene mutation there is an increased risk of breast as well as that of an ovarian cancer okay now let's kind of discuss a couple of few more points regarding this so what are the other points which you need to discuss so if i just ask you if at all there is a patient who is having a BRCA gene mutation okay so let's say there is a patient who is having a BRCA gene mutation let's say the age of the patient is 20 years and if I ask you, you want to perform a screening of this particular patient, okay? So you want to screen this particular patient, whether this particular patient is having any breast cancer or not. Now, what would be the screening investigation of choice over here? For the screening, the investigation of choice in this particular patient, it will be an MRI, guys. Okay, what would be the answer? It would be an MRI. Now, what you need to appreciate is that if at all you want to perform a screening, and this needs to be done done in the general population okay if at all the screening needs to be done in the general population what is the investigation of choice for this yeah and this is uh, what i'm talking about if at all the female is less than 40 years less than 40 years female and the screening to be done in the general population the investigation of choice over here is a usg but please understand if at all a screening is to be done in a younger female like less than 40 years of age and if at all the patient is having a familial breast carcinoma syndrome or whatever here the investigation of choices and MRI guys okay please understand this here the answer is an MRI I hope you get this point so this is important which you need to understand now moving on to the next question guys what is an investigation of choice to diagnose an undescended testes so what do you think guys what is the investigation of choice to diagnose an undescended testes is it an mri cct diagnostic laparoscopy or the usg what is the investigation of choice now answer here is that diagnostic laparoscopy guys now this is again a very 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 important concept which you need to understand so let us talk a bit more about it so let's say there is a female who is bringing the child to you and the female is basically saying that this is uh, my let's say a newborn child and this particular child is having an empty scrotum that that is the testes is basically not present in the scrotum so here let's say the child is having an empty scrotum empty scrotum so this particular child has been brought to you you are the doctor the child has been brought to you 
how will you manage this particular patient okay how will you manage this particular patient so what you have to do is the first thing which you need to do over here is you will try to palpate it okay so how will you manage this patient okay so if at all you get a kind of a child with a empty scrotum how will you manage a patient so first is you will try to palpate it okay so what you'll do you will try to palpate the testes where will you palpate the disease in the inguinal canal why because the most common site of undescended testes is the inguinal canal so if at all you are able to palpate it in the inguinal canal if you find this in the inguinal canal great what you need to do is you just go in for an exploration you explore this particular patient and you yeah this is what you do you explore this particular patient but let's say if at all you are unable to palpate the testes is not palpable okay if at all the testes is not palpable then what is the next thing which you need to do you need to perform something which is called as a diagnostic laparoscopy laparoscopy when you perform a diagnostic laparoscopy what you need to do is you need to go inside the abdomen of this particular patient and you need to follow a testicular artery so you follow your testicular artery now why do you want to follow a testicular artery because you know that wherever the organ goes it takes the blood supply along with it so you do a diagnostic laparoscopy and you follow the testicular artery this testicular artery will take you to the testes are you understand my point so this is how you work up a patient if at all you have a patient with an empty scrotum or you suspect an undescended testes in a patient right so this is how you work up it so definitely the investigation of choice for an undescended testes it is a diagnostic laparoscopy now i've seen many students marking it as an mri or a cct they think that okay those who mark mri they basically think that okay uh, this testes is a soft tissue and mri is the best investigation for a soft tissue so let us go and mark an mri but please understand guys this is how your mind might work in the on the day of the exam but please don't do that this is not the correct answer the correct answer is a diagnostic laparoscopy okay now the next kind of uh, okay the next question which i have is the corydocal cyst disease is thought to be caused by an abnormality of the following okay so can you please tell me corydocal cyst it's caused because of the abnormality of what like is it because of the bile duct smooth muscles or bile composition bile duct adventitia or pancreaticular biliary duct junction do so guys answer over here is d okay so now let us understand why is this corydocal cyst appearing okay so see understand what is a corydocal cyst what do you understand by a corydocal cyst what do you understand by a corydocal cyst corydocal cyst basically is a congenital anomaly of bile duct what is it it is a congenital anomaly of the bile duct now what congenital anomaly is happening over here it is not like there is a congenitally cystic dilation or something like that what you need to appreciate is that let's say this is your bile duct it is coming and it is joining your pancreatic duct and the pancreatic duct and the bile duct they have a common pathway and then they open at your your sphincter so what do you have guys in order to prevent this particular pancreatic juice from entering into the bile duct you have multiple sphincters over here so you have two sphincters in the bile duct one in the pancreatic and one as a common sphincter these are the four sphincters which you have over here but if at all there is something which is called as a abnormal pancreatic biliary junction abpj okay what is this abpj this is an abnormal pancreatic biliary junction if you have this what can happen your bile can reflux <coughs> to the uh yeah sorry your pancreatic juice can actually reflux into the bile duct i'm really sorry over here what can happen if at all you have a abpj there is a possibility that your pancreatic secretions okay so your pancreatic secretions they can actually reflux to your bile duct and it can lead to the dilation of the bile duct okay it can lead to the dilation of the bile duct and ultimately the patient will end up having a corydocal 
cyst and ultimately the patient will land up having a colloidal cyst i understand my point so this is the mechanism why do you get a colloidal cyst because of an abpj abnormal pancreatic biliary junction okay the next question which i have for you guys on performing an endoscopic kind of therapy for the bleeding peptic ulcer we found that there is a visible vessel at the base of the ulcer what is the stage according to the forest classification now here what you need to understand is that let's say there is a patient who is having a bleeding okay so patient is basically having the bleeding like the upper ga bleeding is present in this particular patient you perform an endoscopy and based on the endoscopy finding you have a classification system which is called as a forest classification okay so you have a classification system which is basically called as a forest classification now what you need to understand over here is that uh what you need to understand over here is that let's say there is a bleeding peptic ulcer let's say there is a bleeding peptic ulcer and when you basically perform an upper ga endoscopy you classify this as a forest classification okay you basically classify it as a forest classification now what is this particular forest classification what is included over here so you have 1a 1b and 2a then you have 2b and lastly you have 2c and 3 so what is this 1a 1b 2a 2b 2c and 3 in the 1a what do you get you basically get that there is an active pulsatile bleeding okay so there is an active pulsatile bleed this is what is called as a 1a if you give an active oozing if it all there is an active oozing of the blood this is what is called as a 1b then in 2a what do you get you get a what do you get in 2a so this is just a visible vessel you have a visible vessel so let's go back to this particular question what is the answer over here it is grade 2a here we had a visible vessel right we had a visible vessel at the base so this gives you a diagnosis of a like the grade is basically 2a okay i hope you get this point now why i have drawn this or written this with a kind of a different color because in these what is happening there is a very very high risk of bleeding okay so they are having a very high risk of bleeding that is why a uh, rebleeding okay so they have a very very high risk of rebleeding that is why it has been written with a separate color now let us come to the 2b what do you get in the 2b so you don't have a visible vessel over here what you have is an adherent clot so you basically get an adherent clot which is basically having a moderate risk of rebleeding okay it is a moderate rebleeding risk this is what you get in the 2b and what do you get in the 2c and 3 guys so in the 2c what you get is a you get a pigmentation at the base of ulcer so you have ulcer and there is a pigmentation which is basically present at the base of the ulcer this is what is 2c and in the 3 what do you get in the 3 like the category 3 of this you get a ulcer with normal healed base so ulcer with the normal base this is category 3 i hope you get this point now this has been written with white because this is having a low risk of rebleeding okay this is having a low risk of low risk of rebleeding i hope you get this particular point so this is what you get in the forest classification okay this is what you basically get in the forest classification right so this is a forest classification for your bleeding peptic ulcer now okay this is again the uh, kind of table from your uh, sebastian you can just go through it this is what i just narrated to you you can just remember it okay right now which of the following is the best uh, treatment for a patient with a cholelithiasis 3 years after cholecystectomy so if at all you have a patient who has suffered from a cholelithiasis 3 years after the cholecystectomy what is the best treatment is it like a administration of a urodeoxycholic acid or percutaneous transhepatic stone extraction endoscopic sphincterotomy and the stone removal or the stone extraction and yeah this is laparoscopic bile duct exploration with the t tube placement now what you need to understand is what is the answer over here it is a option number c that is the best option which you can go in for a cholelithiasis in a patient after cholecystectomy now 
okay it's pretty straight forward guys if at all you have diagnosed a patient with a coli docolithiasis okay you have diagnosed a patient with a coli doco lithiasis now what do you understand by coli doco lithiasis coli doco lithiasis means that there is a stone in common bile duct so if at all you have a stone in the common bile duct and you have diagnosed it so yeah what you basically going for you going for an e RCP. What is this ERCP? This is endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreaticography. So what is this? This is your endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreaticography. Now, along with this, you have to go in for a sphincterotomy. Now, what is this sphincterotomy, guys? In this sphincterotomy, what you basically do is, okay, so in this sphincterotomy, basically what you do, there is a sphincter of odi and you cut this particular sphincter. But another important MCQ is, where do you cut this sphincter? So you cut this sphincter either at 11 o'clock position or a 1 o'clock position. So this is a sphincter which you have and you can cut it at 11 o'clock or 1 o'clock. Okay, so you can cut it at 11 o'clock or 1 o'clock position. So you can do that. And if you do it, what is going to happen? Whatever the built up pressure is, it is going to get released. And whatever the stones are there, the stones are going to come out. Okay, so this is what you mean by ERCP with the sphincterotomy. This is what you perform in the cold colithiasis. Now, frankly speaking, it doesn't matter whether you have already done a cholecystectomy or not. It was just an added information which was given in this particular question. But yeah, it really doesn't matter. Now, with this, what you need to understand, there are two terminologies. One is what is called as a retained stone. There's something which is called as a retained stone. And there is something which is called as a recurrent stone. So what you need to understand is, if at all there is a stone which is present and it is detected in less than two years after cholecystectomy, this is what you call it as a retained stone. So what is a retained stone? If at all you have a stone which is basically present, which is detected in less than two years after the cholecystectomy has been performed, this is what is a retained stone. What is a recurrent stone? A stone which is occurring more than two years after cholecystectomy. This is what you have as a recurrent stone okay i hope you get this so there is a retained stone then there is a recurrent stone now what is this okay the next question which i have is what is the size of a kind of a orange foley catheter so what is the size of an orange foley catheter the answer is 16 french guys now this is very very important so what you need to understand is that what is the most common catheter which you basically use in the males okay so what is the most common foley catheter which you use in males okay what is the most common foley catheter which you use in males so it is your orange that is 16 french then what is the most common foley catheter which you use in your females the answer is 14 French that is your green one and what is the most common Foley's catheter which you use in children okay what is the most common Foley's which you use in children what is the answer for you here it is 12 French that is your white now if you remember others it's really great if you don't at least remember these three like 16 French, 14 French and 12 French at least these three you should remember. So what are these guys? So these are the other coding systems that you have. So as you can see over here, we have just talked about your white, your green and orange. This is 12 French, 14 French and 16 French. Along with this, if you want, you can remember the red, yellow. You can remember that. You can remember that the black is 10. 
If you remember these, this is more than enough. I don't think they will go beyond this, right? At the max, you can remember purple is 22, not beyond this, okay? Really not beyond this. But yeah, at least these three are absolute must. Do not forget it up. Okay, now, which of the following is the most important determinant of the need of a drainage of a pancreatic pseudocyst? So if at all you have a pancreatic pseudocyst, what is the most important determinant that, okay, you have to go in for a surgery, you have to kind of drain this particular patient. Now, this is basically based on your concept of your directly from your love and belly guys so earlier it was said that okay if it all it is more than six centimeters in size if it all it is more than six weeks in kind of duration you have to go in for a surgery but what your love and belly is also stressing and that is a true thing that uh, if at all the patient is kind of having symptoms okay if at all the patient is having symptoms no matter what the size is no matter what the duration is you have to kind of go and operate on this particular patient so pseudocyst symptoms this is the primary and the key determinant factor in deciding whether this particular pancreatic pseudocyst is going to kind of be subjected to a surgery or not or something like that okay so the key determinant factor is the symptoms of the patient okay i hope you get this point now okay now let's move on to the next question coagulopathy developing during the surgical exploration is best treated with the transfusion of the rbc's ffp and the platelets in the ratio of now this is again a very very important question and i'm sure this is going to come at one or the other exam it is one is to one is to one now what you need to understand is guys that let's say if at all there is a patient who is in a need of a blood transfusion a massive blood transfusion so what do you understand by a massive blood transfusion a massive blood transfusion so what do you understand by a massive blood transfusion massive blood transfusion means more than or equal to 10 units of blood transfused in 24 hours so if at all you have transfused more than or equal to 10 units of the blood in 24 hours this is what is referred to as a massive blood transfusion okay this is what is referred to as a massive blood transfusion now here what you need to understand is that when you go in for a massive blood transfusion you put the patient through multiple bags now whatever the blood bags are there in the massive blood transfusion whatever the blood bag is there this is basically deficient in ffp and platelets okay this is basically deficient in the ffp and the platelets oh i'm really sorry not exactly the ffp what i was what i meant was it is basically deficient in the clotting factors in the clotting factors and the platelets it is basically deficient right because because the shelf life of the blood bag is nearly 35 days and your platelets and your clotting factors they are more or less destroyed after 10 years 10 days right so that is why most of the blacks must be deficient in your clotting factors and your platelets and that is the reason why if you go in for a massive blood transfusion there will be relative deficiency of the platelets and clotting factors to kind of overcome this there has been a trauma transfusion guidelines and these transfusion guidelines have said that we kind of transfuse rcc is to ffp is to platelets in the ratio of one is to one is to one now what is this rcc rcc is a red cell concentrate okay red cell concentrate you can also refer to as a pcv one in the same thing so pcv is a packed cell volume okay I hope you get this point so this is a rcc or a pcv one and the same thing and this is how you basically this is a recommended way of transfusion at this time right if you want to go in for a massive blood transfusion now there is a patient a nine year old boy who is presenting to you with an abdominal pain and a recurrent uti ivp reveals a duplication of a left ureter the most likely site of opening of an ectopic ureter in this particular patient is what so okay the guys the answer over here is a there is a prosthetic urethra now what you need to understand is what you need to understand is that this particular question is dealing with a duplication of the ureteric system so you have let's say a kidney in the kidney what you have you have an upper pole and you have a lower pole now there is a ureter which is arising from the upper pole and it is opening into the 
kind of the Unix system. Like the lower part, I'll talk to you about this. So let's okay, let's draw it out. So let's say this is your uni bladder, this is your urethra, right? So what is happening? The most common site of opening of the ectopic ureter. So the upper the ureter which is draining the upper pole of the kidney, this is actually opening at an ectopic site. And the ureter which is draining the lower pole of the kidney, let me just draw it with another color. So yeah, if at all let's say there is a ureter which is draining the lower pole of the kidney that is opening in the bladder. Okay, so what is this called as? This is what is called as a Wiegert mayor rule so what do we have we have a Wiegert mayor rule so what is this Wiegert mayor rule this Wiegert mayor rule is basically for your duplication of the ureter this is basically for your duplication of ureter now what is this particular Wiegert mayor rule saying that if at all there's a ureter which is draining the upper pole Okay, if at all, let's say there is a ureter which is draining the upper pole, what is happening? The this particular, if at all, let's say there is a ureter which is draining the upper pole, the ureter is opening at ectopic position, and this is what is obstructing. Okay, so this is obstructing in nature. This particular ureter is obstructing in nature and is opening at an ectopic position. And let's say if at all there is a ureter which is draining the lower pole. If at all there is a ureter which is draining the lower pole of the uh, kidney, this is what is opening into the bladder. And this is what is refluxing. Okay, what is it? It is refluxing. Are you understanding my point? So this is obstructing in nature and this is refluxing in nature. That is the basic difference between the upper pole, like the ureter which is draining the upper pole and the ureter which is draining the lower pole. Now, what you need to understand is that in boys, the most common site of an opening of an ectopic ureter is a prostatic urethra. Okay, so let's talk about the most common site of opening of an ectopic ureter this is basically different in the boys and the girls right so in the males the most common site of an opening of an ectopic ureter this is your prostatic urethra okay this is the most common site of opening of a ectopic ureter in the boys or the males or whatever now along with this like this is the most common site and after that it can also uh, open into the seminal vesicle epididymis other places it can open okay but the most common site is definitely a prostatic urethra now what about the females guys what about the females what is the most common site of opening of an ectopic urethra in the females it is either the distal urethra or the vagina so basically say that it opens at the vestibule okay vestibule of the vagina that is the most common site of opening of a ectopic ureter in the females so they basically ask you about the boys so it is opening in the prostatic urethra okay i hope you get this particular point now which of the following uh, lasers is used for the treatment of a benign prostatic hyperplasia as well as for the urinary calculi so what you need to understand is that uh, for the management of a bph and for the management of the stone we can use lasers we can use lasers. What I'm trying to ask you over here is that which of these particular lasers can be used for the management of both? That is BPH and along with your uh, kind of calculi. The answer is okay. So the answer is hold uh, hold me a mag laser, guys. Okay. Answer is option C. Hold me a mag laser. This is a kind of a laser which we can use for the management of the BPH as well as the urinary calculi or a bladder calculi or something like that now what you need to understand okay so yeah that's fine that's fine okay so one laser which can be used for the management of both bph and the calculi the answer is holmium yak laser okay now if we just talk about one thing in the lasers so if at all let's say there is a patient who is having a bph right and the patient is also having let's say coagulation disorder coagulation disorder of some form the patient is having a coagulation disorder of some form so what is a preferred treatment what is a preferred treatment for this particular patient you have to go in for a laser 
So what do you have? You have something which is called the whole lip. What is this whole lip? This is holmium laser enucleation of prostate. Okay, I hope you get this point. So you have whole lip that is holmium laser enucleation of the prostate. I hope you get this particular point. Okay, so this is what you get here over here. Now, what is this particular instrument over here, guys? What what is the instrument which has been shown to you? So is it like a varies needle, port closure needle, SPC trocar or a liver biopsy needle? The answer is straightforward. The answer over here is a liver biopsy needle, guys. Okay, what is this? This is a liver biopsy needle which you are seeing over here. Now, why this is a liver biopsy needle? Because I hope you are able to appreciate that at the end of this particular stuff, at the end of the stuff, there are, uh, you know, the bifid tips are seen. So this bifid tip, this is kind of a characteristic thing which you, which tells you that this is a patient, uh, this is a needle which is a liver biopsy needle. Now, what is the name of this? It is a Silverman's liver biopsy needle. It is basically called as a Silverman's liver biopsy needle. Okay, I hope you get this one. This is what is called as a Silverman's liver biopsy needle. Now, what is the most common cause of an upper GI bleeding? So, is it like an erosive gastritis, esophageal varices, peptic ulcers, or the malignancy? Overall, what is the most common cause of an upper GI bleeding? What do you think, guys? The most common cause of an upper GI bleeding, it is a peptic ulcer, guys. Okay, please do not mark esophageal varices. This is the most common wrong answer which we get. Please don't mark this. It might look attractive, esophageal varices, but that is not the most common cause, okay? So, what you need to understand is that... Uh, bleeding like upper GI bleeding so what you need to understand is the upper GI bleeding it can be either variceal or it can be non variceal so it is variceal is basically related to portal hypertension So, what you need to understand is that the non variceal bleeding it is constituting 80% of the total upper GI bleeding, and here the most common cause is a peptic ulcer. And this bleeding related to the portal hypertension, this is constituting only 20% of the upper GI bleeding. So, now I hope you know that the peptic ulcer it is the most common cause of upper GI bleeding overall. Very, very important. Okay, I hope you get a stuff. Now, uh, you have a patient who is, let's say, 58 year old woman who is a chronic erythematous oozing encrusted rash involving her left nipple areola complex. There is no palpable breast mass and the finding of a recently obtained mammogram is normal. Which of the following recommendation is appropriate? Okay, what is the recommendation which you will allow this particular patient? Will you refer this particular patient to a dermatologist? Now, will you kind of give this particular patient oral vitamin E and the topical kind of ointments? Will you go in for a punch biopsy or will you go in for a trial of a cortisone? So what will you kind of do in this particular patient? Now guys, please understand, it is a clinical scenario which is looking like a pager's disease. But the things like the things in not in the alignment with the pager's diseases, there is no palpable lump and the mammography is kind of normal. But still, there's a very, very characteristic thing that there is a chronic erythematous oozing encrusting rash which is involving the nipple areola complex so guys this is definitely pointing towards your pager's disease and before you do anything like before you refer this particular patient to a dermatologist for the eczema and all those stuff you have to take a punch biopsy if at all you take a punch biopsy and on punch biopsy you are seeing a clear cells so like big cells with a clear cytoplasm or something which are called as a pagetoid cells this is something which is diagnostic of your pager's disease okay i hope you get this point this is what is the diagnostic of your pager's disease now the next question which you have is regarding rhabdomyolysis yeah uh, acute renal failure occurs secondary to the release of the myoglobin and alkalinotic environment promotes the formation of a myoglobin cast in the renal tubules and thereby worsening the kidney damage the renal failure Rhabdomyolysis typically resolves within 3 to 5 days. Alkalinization of the pH between 8 to 9 is an important treatment goal. Okay, so what you need to understand over here is that 
Right. So the answer we hear is that acute renal failure occurs secondary to the release of a myoglobin. Okay, that is the answer over here. That is basically a true statement. Now, what you need to understand is that an alkaline environment promotes the formation of a myoglobin cast in the renal tubules, thereby worsening the renal damage. This is wrong. Okay, alkaline ac uh, environment actually prevents this. Okay, alkaline environment actually prevents the formation of these casts and the in the renal tubules and everything. And that is why, for the rhabdomyolysis, what is the treatment which we have? We have a alkaline diuresis this is a treatment which we have the renal failure of rhabdomyolysis typically resolves within three to five days not really it is kind of a permanent stuff it doesn't resolve on its own okay now this is fine we have to go in for alkalization but the ph it's not supposed to be between eight to nine because at this particular ph again the precipitation will happen but you have to kind of take it above the physiological ph so above is like 7.3 so you have to basically maintain it between let's say 7.3 to 8 or something like that okay so here you have to maintain it between 7.3 to 8 but you should not go to 8 to 9 because here again the precipitation will happen but definitely alkaline diuresis is something which you are eyeing at now on abdominal ultrasound the gallbladder stone uh, shows a diffuse wall thickening with a hyperechoic nodule at the neck with a comet tail artifact what is the most likely diagnosis of this particular patient? So here it is a kind of a clinical scenario, some kind of condition of a gallbladder and on the ultrasound you are getting a comet tail artifact. What do you think guys? What is the diagnosis of here? So answer over here is an adenomyomatosis. Okay. What is the answer over here? It is an adenomyomatosis. This is what you are getting in like in the adenomyomatosis you get a comet tail artifact. What is this comet tail artifact? So I hope you are able to appreciate this is you have performed a USG. And this is looking like a comet tail, right? So what is a comet tail? Comet tail is basically having a head like this. And then just behind this, you have this particular comet tail artifact. This is what is a comet tail artifact, okay? If you get a comet tail artifact on the USG in the gallbladder, most of the times it is adenomyomatosis, right? So yeah, that is the answer over here. A patient, uh, the next question which we have is, a patient who has been operated for the Bilroth type 2, surgery develops seizures and the patient had taken lunch around three years before the episode when you uh, do a serum blood glucose in this particular patient it comes out to be 40 milligrams per deciliter what is the diagnosis of this particular patient is this particular patient suffering from early dumping syndrome late dumping syndrome duodenum stump blowout or an anastomotic leak what do you think guys what is the answer over here so here the answer to this particular question is a late dumping syndrome now, let us understand what is a dumping syndrome, okay? What is a dumping syndrome, guys? So, let's say if at all you have a intestine and what is happening is, guys, what is happening is, okay, so let's understand what is happening normally. So, normally what do you have? You have your stomach and at the end of the stomach, what do you have? You have a pylorus. So, you have a stomach and you have a pylorus. Now, when we, like, we basically eat the food, what is happening? The food is entering into the stomach and the food is in this particular stomach for some time. This is what is called as a gastric holding time. It is called as a gastric holding time. So this gastric holding time is two hours. Okay, I understand my point. This gastric holding time is two hours. So the food basically remains in the stomach for two hours. This is what is called as a gastric holding time. And even when the kind of the stomach contracts, okay, even when the the stomach contracts what is going to happen the food will be shifted from this particular stomach to the intestine but a very very small kind of quantity of that particular thing will go to the first part of the duodenum second part of the duodenum. this is what is called as a hyper osmolar kind what is it it is a hyperosmolar kind. Okay, so this hyperosmolar kind, only few mLs of they are allowed to go from the stomach into the intestine because of the regulatory mechanism of the pylorus. Now, what you have done in the Billroth surgery, in this particular question, they had a Billroth type 2 surgery. So what you basically have done over here, let's say if it all this is the stomach. Okay, let's say this is the stomach. And let's say there was a tumor over here. So they kind of cut the stomach like this. And they have go and gone for a loop gastro jejunostomy so what they have done is you have they have taken a loop of the jejunum and they have gone for a loop gastro jejunostomy okay so what did they they performed a loop gastro jejunostomy this is what is a loop 
gastrojejunostomy. So, if at all you have performed a loop gastrojejunostomy, definitely there is no pylorus over here, right? So now what is going to happen? Whatever the food you are going to eat, it is not going to stay in the stomach. It is directly going to go to the distal part of the intestine. And as we know, this is what is a hyper or smaller chyme. Okay, what is this? This is your hyper or smaller chyme. Okay, I hope you got this point. Now let us understand what is happening inside the intestine. Okay, inside the intestine, what is happening? Let's say this is the intestine, and what you are having, you are having a hyper or smaller chyme over here. Now, what is the role of the hyper or smaller chyme? Hyper or smaller chyme basically causes the sequestration of the fluid. Okay, it causes a sequestration of fluid into the intestine, so it will cause a sequestration of fluid into the intestine yeah this is what is going to cause and because of this what is going to happen the volume of the fluid in the intestine is going to increase and the patient will land up into diarrhea okay and the patient will land up into diarrhea i understand my point so this is what is called as a early dumping syndrome this is what is called as a early dumping syndrome so what do you get in the early dumping syndrome this is basically happening like within 30 minutes to one hour after you have kind of eaten food or all those stuff and here the patient is coming to you with the diarrhea and the patients will basically develop signs of dehydration so patient is basically going to develop a signs of dehydration over here Okay, I hope you get this particular point. This is what is called as a early dumping syndrome. Okay, this is what is called as a early dumping syndrome. Now, next, what do you have? You have something which is called as a late dumping syndrome. In the late dumping syndrome, what is the mechanism? Please understand. So let's say if at all this is your intestine and what has happened? You remember this hyperosmolar chyme? So this hyperosmolar chyme had come in it. So there are a few receptors which are basically present on the intestine. These hyperosmolar chyme, they act on the receptors and these receptors, they send the signals to the pancreas. Okay, so these receptors, they send the signal to the pancreas and from the pancreas, what is secreted? Insulin. So what is basically happening is that these receptors go to the pancreas and they tell pancreas, okay, you know what? Such a large amount of the hyperosmolar chyme has come into the intestine. So you better start secreting the insulin because sooner or later, this is going to get absorbed and then you will be needing this particular insulin. Okay, so pancreas is basically secreting insulin. But what is happening? This hyperosmolar chyme, whatever is here, it is not getting absorbed and it is kind of going to the stool. Okay, it is basically not getting absorbed. So what is happening? The crux of the matter is there is a relative excess of insulin as compared to that of a glucose. Okay, compared to that of a glucose, you have a relative excess of the insulin. And because of this, what do you get? You get hypoglycemia. Okay, because there is a relative excess of the insulin, we are getting hypoglycemia. This is what is called as a late dumping syndrome. And this usually occurs two to three hours after the food intake. Okay, so this is what is called as a late dumping syndrome. I hope you have understood this particular concept. I'll just repeat it. But as you can see over here, after the build-out type 2 surgery, after the eating food, after three years, the patient came to you with the signs of hypoglycemia. So definitely the answer is late dumping syndrome. So I just kind of cover it in like one minute. Normally what is happening, when the kind of stomach contracts, a few ml of the hyperosmolar chyme, it enters into the intestine. Right, that is what is the regulatory mechanism of your pylorus. But if at all you perform this, build rod type 2 surgery now this particular regulatory mechanism is gone and a large amount of the hyperosmolar chyme is going to enter into the intestine if at all this is happening what is going to happen there can be an early dumping syndrome which is basically sequestration of the fluid into the intestine because of the hyperosmolar chyme and ultimately the patient is landing up into diarrhea this is what is the early dumping syndrome but Okay, here the patient is going to come to you with the signs and symptoms of the dehydration. That is fine. And the patient is presenting within 30 minutes to one hour after this particular food intake or something like that. At the same time, there is something which is called as a late dumping syndrome. What is this late dumping syndrome? So here this hyperosmolar chyme which has entered into the intestine, it is acted on by the receptors. These receptors take the signals, pass it on to the pancreas and the pancreas basically secretes the insulin. 
right so pancreas is secreting insulin with a contemplation that this hyperosmolar kind will get absorbed and now i'll be needing the insulin but what is happening the glucose is washed away into the stool and none of them is kind of absorbed and that is why there is a relative excess of the insulin in the body ultimately this excess insulin acts on whatever the glucose is present and the patient kind of lands up into hypoglycemia that is all about the late early and the late dumping syndrome which you need to understand the next question which you have is a patient had uh, detected has been detected with an incidental liver lesion and you performed an mri in this particular patient on performing an mri you get a image like this okay so this is an image which you are getting on an mri what do you think guys what is the diagnosis of this particular patient is it patient suffering from a hepatocellular carcinoma hemangioma hepatic adenoma or a focal nodular hyperplasia the answer over here is hemangioma what is the patient suffering from the patient is basically suffering from hemangioma okay so yeah this is what is hemangioma now what do you get on the hemangioma when you basically perform an mri on the hemangioma guys on the mri we basically get a light bulb appearance what do you get you get a light bulb appearance or a light bulb sign or something like that now if you look at this particular image closely why it is called as a light bulb sign or a light bulb appearance or something because the surrounding is kind of a bit black it is having a bit blacker shade but if you just look at this particular hemangioma how bright it is okay so you have a very very bright hemangioma and this is what is basically telling you that this is a yeah this is what is your light bulb appearance which you basically get in the patients of hemangioma okay i hope you get this point now uh right that's fine now let's talk about this what is the most common site of the pancreatic carcinoma so here basically i'm talking to you about pancreatic adenocarcinoma okay so what do you think guys what is the most common site for a pancreatic adenocarcinoma the answer over here is a carcinoma head of the pancreas okay so the most common site of a pancreatic adenocarcinoma it is a carcinoma head of the pancreas that is the most common site now what you need to understand over here is that what you need to really understand over here is that um uh, okay so obviously the most common site like more than 75 to 80% of the carcinoma of the pancreas they arise on the head and these are the ones which are presenting early so they have a early presentation and they are having a good prognosis early pre presentation good prognosis this is what you get in the carcinoma head of the pancreas okay i hope you get this point now yeah because they are having a early presentation that is why you can operate and yeah these are the ones which are having the best prognosis amongst all the pancreatic carcinomas there is something which is called as a star chiodine test can you please tell me what this is useful for what so this is basically used for for the diagnosis of a fray syndrome there's a star chiodine test and we use this particular star chiodine test to diagnose the fray syndrome now what is this fray syndrome so simply put fray syndrome is nothing but it is a gustatory sweating so what do you understand by this gustatory sweating guys what is this particular gustatory sweating so this is what is your normal auricular temporal now okay so what is happening over here like normally normally what is happening there is a sympathetic fibers these sympathetic fibers are supplying the sweat gland these sympathetic fibers are supplying the salivary gland okay so this is what is happening but at the same time there are parasympathetic fibers and these parasympathetic fibers are only supplying the salivary gland they're not supplying the sweat gland this is what is normally present now if at all you go in for a parotid surgery okay so let's say if at all there is any parotid surgery and due to some reason there is an injury to your you know auricular temporal now if at all let's say there is an injury to the auricular temporal now then what is going to happen there is going to be something which is called as a cross innervation okay so what is going to happen there is going to be a cross innervation between the fibers now what kind of cross innervation is happening as you know normally in the normal person parasympathetic fibers were supplying only the sweat gland uh, only the salivary glands but after this particular cross innervation what is happening these parasympathetic fibers they also supply the sweat gland along with the or uh, some kind of salivary glands so every time the patient has a salivation even these sweat glands are kind of stimulated and because of this we get your uh, kind of sweating so i hope you get this point this is what is called as a fray syndrome and if at all you want to diagnose this fray syndrome the one of the test or the very good test which you have is something which is called as a star chiodine test so in this what you basically do in the star chiodine test you apply a liquid 
iodine you apply the liquid iodine on the face of the person and then what you do you apply the starch over it and then you apply the starch over it if at all you just do this nothing happens then what you do after this you ask the patient to eat lemon or any other substance you ask the patient to eat so that the salivation when happening if at all the salivation happens and along with this if at all there is also a sweating which is happening so there is a characteristic that in the presence of the sweat the starch and the iodine they react with each other and they lead to a brownish black appearance okay brown black appearance this is you get if at all there is a sweating which is present in the presence of your liquid iodine and the starch so this is what is referred to as your kind of starch iodine test okay i hope you get this point this is what is a starch iodine test right now false about the tips which of the following is false about the tips procedure so shunt thrombosis is more common than the stenosis uh encephalopathy is more common improves ascites and the hydrothorax much better control of the bleeding than the variceal ligation now guys the answer over here is a what you need to understand is that overall okay so in the tips you have two complications you can have either a stunt stenosis or you can have a stunt uh, sorry you can have either a shunt stenosis or you can have a shunt thrombosis these are the two main complications which you can give <coughs> get in the uh, kind of uh, tips procedure what is this tips tips basically stands for transhepatic okay uh, right it is basically a it is a porto systemic shunt okay so what you basically doing is uh, you are basically going for a okay i'm really sorry so this is what is your trans jugular intrahepatic porto systemic shunt so what you are basically doing in over here you are going in through your a uh, jugular vein you are going in till your right hepatic vein and then you have your right portal vein so you are putting a shunt between your right hepatic vein and your right portal vein you are basically putting a shunt between this okay so this is what is the tips procedure now what you need to appreciate is that there are two main complications which can occur after this particular procedure there is something which is called as a shunt thrombosis and then there is something which is called as a shunt stenosis now this shunt stenosis this is the most like this is the most common complication overall but the thing is it takes more than 6 months like this is going to happen after 6 months right that when there is a shunt thrombosis this is the most common early complication so if at all they ask you which is the most common early complication then the answer is shunt thrombosis but if at all they ask you what is the most common overall complication definitely the answer is shunt stenosis guys okay i hope you get this point so here the answer is shunt thrombosis is more common no it is not true it is less common as compared to the stenosis it is just in the acute phase like in the early phase the shunt thrombosis is something which is more common okay so well guys yeah this is it that is all about the mcqs which i wanted to discuss with you thank you so much for joining with me i hope this particular session added some value to you so yeah thank you and happy studying see you in the next session